everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and this is David Wood. David is the author of several action-adventure novels, including his latest, Quest, which is a Dane Maddock adventure. There it is. <laughs> he also writes fantasy under a pseudonym and has a zombie novel out at the moment and is the co-presenter of Thrillercast, <laughs> of the podcast for thriller lover lovers with Alan Baxter, who's been on the show before. So welcome, Dave. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Nice to see your face finally. Yeah, I love the video Skype. It's brilliant. But if you're listening on the podcast, don't worry. You'll hear everything we're going to talk about. So, okay, so maybe you can start by telling us a bit more about you and your writing and publishing journey. Okay, well, I started out, oh, I, wanted, I think it was back in 03. I had pretty much spent my life considering myself an author in my brain, but the problem was I never actually got around to writing anything. And um, my best friend sent me an email, and he said, this is the most awesome email. And I opened it, and it simply said, if you could do anything in the world you wanted, what would it be? And then you scrolled down and said, what's stopping you? And for some reason, on that day, it really spoke to me. I joined an online writing workshop and got going with my writing. And then in 03, I did National Novel Writing Month. And that's where my first book, Dorado, came from. And for various reasons, but mostly because I'm impulsive and whimsical, I self-published it on Lulu, figuring, you know, my mom and dad would buy a copy. But it started selling. And that freaked me out because I had made every movie mistake in the world. I hadn't bothered to learn anything about publishing. So I went about learning how to make it better and putting it back out. And from that, I got really fascinated with small press. And we didn't have the term independent publishing back then. So I started Griffinwood Press. I signed a few authors and continued to work on my own stuff. So when my second book, Cibola, came out, really picked up the pace. I did it right and had a lot of good success. And so thrillers have really become my focus, although I do write the speculative fiction, as you mentioned. I've had a little side foray into doing a patio book with my historical book, Into the Word, but really the thrillers are my big focus. So at this point, I've got three Dane Matic adventures out. They're doing well, and I'm writing full-time, which is very exciting. That is brilliant, but we should say you've been a teacher, haven't you? So you've written most of your books whilst working. Yes. Um, I actually worked in the United Methodist Church for a number of years doing different things, which people who know my personality find that very odd, but it just sort of happened. And so from there, I then went into teaching and was in the classroom for several years. So I've always had to kind of watch the content of my books, too, because I want to be mindful of who might want to buy them. So although my books, interestingly, we've got a pretty high body count in most of them. People don't seem to be bothered by that. But, you know, we keep the sex off screen and the language is, is pretty PG. Mm, absolutely. Right. So your books rank very well in men's action adventure. And I wanted to ask you about that. Um, maybe you could describe the key aspects of that genre and how your Dane Maddock books fit into that. Well, I guess that it's usually involving something either military related. Definitely have to have shoot 'em up in it. Uh, you'll find some books like mine, which are the Indiana Jones style brought into the modern day action adventure. There's lots of action, a little bit of mystery. There's usually a lovely lady on the side. And uh, you see a lot of Clive Cussler books in that chart. And then you'll see the military thrillers. Brad Thor is big on that chart. Um, Bob Mayer, who is doing a lot of independent publishing now, is ranking very high. And I noticed, I assume it's parallel, but in the UK, I'm seeing myself on Lad Lit. I guess that's the same thing. I don't know. But I think it's very much action with a um, little bit of mystery thrown in. And again, Clive Cussler, Matthew Riley, people like that are going to be on that chart. Mm. Yeah. And is there a difference between men's action adventure and I rate in uh, action adventure? Is it just because literally you're a man and men buy it or do men I, buy in both? <laughs> I don't even recall how I wound up on men's adventure because I don't remember putting my books into that category. I think it might have been created after I got into Kindle because I got in very early. Um, yeah, I guess it's the stereotype shoot 'em up kind of adventure, a little more violence and a little less romance, perhaps. Whereas action adventure seems to be a little broader. You'll have Dan Brown, your books, things like that in there. Mm, no, absolutely. Okay, so let's also talk about series novels because um, you're on, what, number three for Dane Mazzuc? Yes. Yeah, so what are some of the challenges of writing a series, As you know, particularly as I'm writing number two at the moment and finding the plotting across multiple books quite difficult? 
Yeah, in the thriller genre, for me, it's not as difficult as my fantasy books. With the um, thrillers, there are just a few minimal plot threads. Of course, you need to be consistent and remember little things like what their handgun of choice is. Um, the arcs that I'm carrying over are pretty limited. I'm slowly developing the main bad guys that they're going to come up against. So being careful to figure out where, what have I done with this group, and I want to be consistent. Who did I kill off? Who has a chance of surviving? So the little consistencies. I told you the bird would get worked up. Can you hear her? <laughs> she wants to be a star. Yeah. Uh, so in the thriller genre, that's it. I tr my goal is to start small so that as I expand, I, have, I don't have as much to build off of. So I don't have a huge invented backstory with, for example, the antagonist. That, that's coming slowly. But it is important to keep good track of what you've done because your reader is going to notice those things. Um, with fantasy, I found it to be a lot more difficult because I've created a world, nations, religions, cultures, personal histories of all these characters. Some people say that the modern book is harder because people can check up your facts. I find fantasy harder because I can't Google what happened in my fantasy world. So those are the very challenging plot threads for me. So I have to literally write out and track where each character is going, where they've been, um, what's happening in each nation. They're... You know, everything you can imagine that you know about our world, you have to invent. So that's the challenging series for me is keeping that fantasy series going. So you talk there about consistency, and that I'm finding it quite weird that I've almost forgotten some key things about you know my protagonist. Do you keep like a, a, a sheet that describes all about them so you can just refer to a central place? I do have a spreadsheet. I, it probably isn't enough, though. Um, but I do have a little bit about their personal backgrounds. Like I said, the weapon of choice. Um, relatives whom I've mentioned, I discovered in um, going back and updating my ebook formatting that I had a character who hasn't appeared yet. He will, but they've mentioned it. My um, sidekick, Bones, is Cherokee Indian, and he's from North Carolina where there are a lot of casinos. And I've mentioned his uncle, Crazy Charlie, who runs a casino as in kind of a shady character. Well, I didn't realize. In the first book, I had mentioned him. I thought I'd created him in the second book, and I had mentioned a different relationship. He wasn't an uncle. And so I went back and made that little detail consistent because he's going to show up in a future novel. So um, all these little things, like you said, there's so much that goes into writing a novel that you're trying to do well from sentence structure to prose to plot consistency and, and the characters. And so a lot of those very small things slip through the cracks. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so what about locations? Because, you know, thrillers, we have to go around the world, basically. What What is it about thrillers that mean we need these big locations? Well, I think thrillers are very much wish fulfillment novels for people. They're the, um, I try to keep mine low tech because I want my readers to feel like with just a little more resources, a little more training, I could go on this guy's adventure. That could be me. And so I try to pick places, some places that people would just love to go. And I also, it's fun to try to discover a place that no one has heard of that's really cool. Sometimes that's easy thing to do. Sometimes it's frustrating because you discover another writer has just done that. For example, with Quest, I had them going to a particular island that had the most awesome name, Inaccessible Island. And I had this whole scene plotted out. I'd written the chapters. But as I was doing that, I started doing a reread of Jeremy Robinson's books because I'm co-authoring a novel with him. And darned if his characters didn't go there in the first book, and I had just forgotten. So I emailed him cussing at him, and he said, you know, it's no big deal. And I'm like, you know, if I wasn't co-authoring with you, maybe it wouldn't be a big deal. But I definitely don't need your readers who are discovering me for the first time to think I'm just stealing your locales. So sometimes it's frustrating to come up with what you think is original and different and find out it's been done and... You read it and you just forgot about it. Mm. Although, of course, some of the, you know, I write, uh, I've written in Paris and Jerusalem and Rome. These places we can go back to again and again, can't we? Yeah, because there's so many places within that, that big locale. If you're doing a good job of plotting out your scenes, which you do. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about, um, you know, Dane and his uh, witty sidekick, Bones, who um, I, I actually, you know, I think I like Bones best. Um, it, it's funny that, you know, have, have you done that deliberately? How did you get those two characters? Well, you know, Bones is me in a meeting because my job is to make the meeting fun and funny. And so I always 
I'm, I'm a real smart ass. People will. I don't mind admitting that. All my friends say so. When I was working in church work, people said they always cringe just a little bit when I got into the pulpit, but they're also kind of excited because they had no idea what was going to come out of my mouth next. And my students like that about me too. So Bones is my expression of my sense of humor. I don't know if he could carry a novel because I go with that George Costanza from um, Jerry Seinfeld philosophy. When you're in a place and you come out with that one funny line, go ahead and leave the room right then and leave them thinking you're awesome. So Bones sprinkled in his humor, and I did have a great compliment um, from one author who was reading Quest to Blurb. He emailed me, and he came to a particular scene and said, that is the hardest I've ever laughed at any book in my life. And so that, that made me feel good. But, um, yeah, Dane is the more serious part of me. He's got other people's personalities, people whom I've known. But I intentionally made him kind of an earnest character. I think too many thriller heroes are supermen. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have issues. They don't have guilt. They don't have things in their past that trouble them. Um, Dane is tough. He's resourceful. He can fight. Um, my martial arts training really goes into his combat scenes. But he's a very much a regular guy who's got some things in his past that bother him. And Bones is that best friend who balances him out and keeps him realizing that life isn't as serious as you make it sometimes. So I really wanted them to work well together and be, be like best friends who really complement each other because I found that my closest friends are have things in common with me, but they have strengths that balance me out too. Mm. Absolutely. And I'm also interested, because uh, this is also a common theme, is that the the protagonist in thrillers must always be single, as in someone has generally died because they're in their 30s or 40s, mm. then they're never 22, you know, thriller heroes, heroines. Um, and, and I did the same as, you know, right. is the husband died or the wife died or the girlfriend's moved on. Or, and you, you've done it too, haven't you? What, what, what is that about a protagonist that has to be available in some way? Well, I think there needs to be, again, since it's wish fulfillment literature, I think the protagonist needs to be available for, if not a hookup, to be hit on and not feel guilty about it. I can't really imagine a married man going trotting around the globe and, you know, babes are falling all over him. I think some people would feel uncomfortable with that, and it's just a little bit weird. But I think you also need that firm relationship in the background because, again, you want your readers who are mostly people around our age, not to make you as old as me, because I'm sure you're not, um, to identify with these characters. And somebody who's been single all their lives, it's probably a little too much James Bond for them. Mm -hmm. um, you want somebody who you think has a foundation sort of like this, who's been through experiences. And also having that in their past is an easy way to put in some vulnerability and some guilt and some issues. I know you did some things with the choice your character had made with someone close to her earlier in her life that she still struggled with. Mm, I think I think we all need that flawed sort of side. Um, you know, we, we can't have a, as you say, a sort of a, a hero with no no flaws. Okay, so I also really wanted to ask you about the whole violence issue, um, or whether it's not an issue. I mean, we we do it. I mean, you have a very high body count in Quest. I actually think it's higher than your other books. <laughs> yeah, I'm cranking it up a notch. It's a little yeah. darker, a um, little more shoot 'em up. Um, Part of it is because you don't – I think the people expect that your main character is going to make it through to the end with some scars. And so you need to create suspense as to how they're going to get there. You need to make them care about the supporting cast and will the supporting cast survive. And also by making the challenges they face greater, you can show more parts of their abilities and their skills, put those on display. And plus I just wanted to kind of ratchet up the story a little bit. Dorado, my first book, was a very Indiana Jones, um, solve the mystery and go to the big ending type story. Cibola, my second, I think one reviewer called it the Da Vinci Code of the Southwest because it was very much solving the puzzle, piecing together all these things from the different Anasazi ruins, solving the ancient mystery, and then the showdown with the bad guys. This one has got more action throughout. I really wanted to develop the antagonist because I think I had done a poor job of that in my first two books. So by making their role bigger and bringing them in from the start, I needed to bring them into conflict earlier on. Mm. But um, the violence issue is something that Alan Baxter, a mutual friend, my co-host on the podcast, we laugh about a lot. He was raised in the UK, lives in Australia, and there are different sensibilities about things like sexuality and violence. 
in America, for some reason, we don't really seem to care how many people you kill as long as you don't make love to them. <laughs> and um, so that's something I had to avoid in my novels, knowing who my potential audience was. And it's just something I find interesting. Um, I don't really know, I guess, because America was largely founded by Puritans early on. Maybe that's the reason. But it's interesting that we're afraid of sexuality, but not afraid of violence. Um, now, I don't do gratuitous, gory things. Um, there was also uh, one book I read by a favorite author who, at the very end, had his character kill an unarmed person who was surrendering and didn't really have a good reason for it except just to show, look how badass my character is. I don't, I don't really go for that. It doesn't fit with what my characters would choose to do. Um, so I try to give them a reason for their violence, and I don't describe – I'm not Quentin Tarantino. We don't have to deal, deal with the blood jetting out of the necks and things like that. So I try to have a purpose for it. But I think there also is an expectation in thrillers that there's going to be a body count. Mm. Yeah, and these uh, these sort of violent scenes we write, mm. where do you think they come from, given that we're quite normal people? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know about girls, but as guys, we would play army and cowboys and Indians and always fake shooting people. And I think as long as you're not a sicko person, it's pretty easy to compartmentalize. And just let your imagination run wild. There's probably a little fascination with the movies that have violence in them. Um, I know as a kid I like to read about World War II. Now that I'm older and I know about war and I've known people who have been killed in it, it's not a glory thing anymore, but it's still interesting. I think um, people coming into conflict on that level is fascinating. Um, I listened to the Hardcore History podcast, which is a favorite. And the host, Dan Carlin, did an amazing series on the Punic Wars, and he did such a powerful job of describing that hand-to-hand, eye-to-eye, chopping each other apart, and makes you realize how horrific it is, but it's also fascinating because you want, what does that feel like? How, how does your psyche react? How does your body react? And we wonder what we would do if we were faced with a life-and-death situation. Mm. Yeah, I think it is a way that you know most of us certainly never see this type of thing in real life so it, there is a kind of living on the edge you know thing I guess about mm-hmm. making it up I certainly I mean I, I love action adventure movies um, I'm the you know I choose those uh, to watch so that which is it's quite interesting anyway let's move on because I wanted to you know sort of get into that around you know we like some of the same authors you know we like right. James Rollins we like Matt Riley Jeremy Robinson um so what and I know we talked about this on on your podcast but what do you think about women writing thrillers and obviously there's a lot of women reading thrillers so do you think there is some kind of sexist thing going on um I think it's latent But I do think if people, there are probably a lot of readers who, if they see a woman's name on the cover, they make an assumption that there's going to be too much romantic content um, or too much sexual content. Even if they don't have a problem with those things, I think there's probably a false assumption that a female writer is going to interject a feminine um, level to the book that probably isn't actually going to be there. But I do think there's probably some latent gender bias there. I know there was a time period, I was a lot younger, I was in college, that I was really into fantasy, but I wouldn't read books by female fantasy writers because I just figured I wouldn't like them. Mm. I didn't have a reason for it, and I know if I had that bias, there are probably a lot of other people who had that. And I think it's a shame because I have read some books where um, I wasn't aware of the gender of the author. They were terrific books. Your book is excellent. You've got your name on the front. (laughs) And I hope we can get to that point, but I have noticed that a lot of authors seem to feel that they need to adopt a pen name that's just their initials, for example, so mm. that I guess I'm assuming to avoid that gender bias. Mm. And I'm, I am probably 95% certain that I'm going to be initials. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, on my next book. And also, because of course you can change your author name on Kindle. Sure. So when I release Prophecy, I will change the name on the book and see what happens. Obviously, the people who know us through social media and the podcast, etc., will buy anyway, knowing who we are. Um, yeah. But it's more for people who stumble upon this stuff, I, I suppose. Yeah, and it's a shame that it is that way, and I hope that that will change. But like we talked about, I think that for some reason in this genre, it's considered a guy genre. And so you're, you're writing books that 
stereotypically appeal to guys, even though there are plenty, I know plenty of female readers. Mm. Half the email I get is from female readers who like my books. Exactly, exactly. It's funny, isn't it? It's very odd. Um, okay, so I also wanted to sort of, you know, I, I've seen you, well, I've had a look back through your career, and you, your career seems to be going very well. You know, as you said, you've moved into... Oh. You know, yeah, touch Thanks. wood, and um, you know, you're, you've moved into full time. You've moved out of the day job. You've got a number of books out there that are selling. Um, what What are some of you, the key steps along the way that you could share for those of us who are way behind you? <laughs> okay, um, I'm a big believer in making your cover look like other books in the genre. It doesn't have to be a duplicate. A lot of first time self published writers think I'm self publishing, so I'm going to make this an expression of me. And so the cover they make might be cool, but it doesn't blend in. And I, I personally believe that that's a key to success is that when readers are clicking through Amazon and looking at these thumbnail images, that your cover doesn't make them go. Because <laughs> even if it's a cool cover, I think they're looking for more of the same when they're shopping. I know when I shop for new authors, even if I'm planning on buying a physical book, I go to Amazon and I scroll through people's list manias or – People who bought this author also bought. And if the cover stands out in a weird way, I think that's a mistake. So when I corrected Dorado and fixed it, that was one of the things I did is I modeled it in layout after some other covers. It's not the best cover in the world, uh, neither is Cibola, but they're pretty good, and they look like thriller covers. So I think that's the first thing. The second is that you know, it's been seven years since I put out Dorado, so it's, be ready for the slow build. Some people will have instant success, but... If you can let readers see that you're in it for the long haul and you're going to keep doing your best and really try to put out the best product you can and slowly build, you can get to a point where you have a nice back catalog that's going to support you. But I think patience is key, which I don't really have a lot of, but I've just, that's what I've done. I didn't really have the option of quitting my day job earlier, so I was forced into being a patient person. And then also conduct yourself like authors whom you admire. And there are some exceptions in independent publishing. We're going to try some gimmicky and different things, but I wouldn't say get way out there, do weird and oddball things. Just ask yourself, would James Rollins do this? And if he wouldn't, maybe it's not the right thing to do. Would James Rollins get into this flame war on the website? So um, those are the three things I would really do. A good cover that blends in, um, be in it for the long haul, and conduct yourself like a professional or like what you think a professional would, would be. Mm. No, I like that. And I'm, I'm thinking more and more about this long haul thing at the moment, given that, you know, you see the, the top authors, the top earners out, out there at all. I, I think they must be in their 50s, maybe even in their early 60s. And they've been writing since the 70s. So I figure, you know, it takes a while, doesn't it, to get a backlist going, to get you know, everything built up. We shouldn't all be so desperate to make it tomorrow. Yeah, um, I found myself feeling a little bit discouraged at times that I'm not making Joe Conrath money or John Locke money or something like that. But then I counted up how many books Conrath has, and I mm -hmm. multiplied my catalog, or the money I make by that, and I'm like, you know, I could be someday. I just need to keep at it. So, again, that's part of the long haul and the patience. Continue grinding away. Um, you know, it's like erosion. Water doesn't always immediately grind away stone, but eventually it will give it enough time. So maybe mm -hmm. that's what it takes in writing, too. Absolutely. I totally agree. And, you know, I feel the same way. I've got, you know, my sales for Pentecost are brilliant for one yeah. book. And um, but, you know, that check doesn't mean much unless it's, you know, you've got five books, 10 books mm -hmm. like, or 40 books like Comrath, you know, then you can see right. how he makes that much money. It's not rocket science it's just writing um hmm. you know which some would yeah. say is rocket science i guess <laughs> yeah and um, dean wesley smith frequently does a good job of bringing out the math of publishing <laughs> and if you go through go check out his blog the um, killing the sacred cows of publishing hmm. and he'll do a lot of things where he'll reduce it to math and it's kind of a good way of talking yourself down realizing okay these can work if i just slow down and really think about the numbers and think about my commitment to it. So he's a person I would recommend reading. 
especially if you want to go into independent publishing. Mm, no, he's great, and we have had him on the show, so I'll refer people oh, cool. uh, to that. In, that. In the Maybe podcast. I did listen to that one. I don't know. I'll have to look back. <laughs> no, he's, he is great. Okay, so I wanted to ask you uh, quickly about your podcast. So you've got the Thriller Cast, which you and Alan have been doing for a while now. And so why did you start that, and what do you feel it has achieved? Well, we started it mostly because the two of us um, – our wives don't want to hear us talk about books, and we want to talk, and we want to be listened to. Um, we love podcasts, and I had just noticed that there wasn't anything devoted to thrillers and action adventure that I was aware of. There's tons of speculative fiction podcasts, lots of great ones, but there wasn't anything that focused on action adventure. Um, I had thought about more of an adventure cast or something like that, but Alan and I wanted to do the project together, and his books are definitely thrillers, but they're on the dark speculative side, so we went with the name Thriller Cast, which is good and bad because some people think it's Michael Jackson. And we have, no, no, we're not. We're not doing, <laughs> woo -hoo, we're doing action adventure books and urban fantasies and anything that's a thriller. So that's why we did it. We, um, we're still authors first. We want to be known as authors who enjoy podcasting rather than podcasters who happen to write mm -hmm. books. Because I think there are some podcasters who have fallen into that and really the podcasting has almost hurt their writing success because people don't think of them as as a real authors, they're podcasters who wrote a book. So, um, you know, we've got a slow build on our audience, but it's we're achieving a lot of things we wanted to. We're getting to meet new people in the genre. Mm -hmm. Our big goal is to get people to recognize the common threads that run through a lot of different genres because there are things that you can enjoy in a Brad Thor book or a Clive Cussell book. Then you can find elements of those in a Neil Gaiman book if you pick the mm -hmm. right book. So we want people to see that there's a whole spectrum of thrillers where hopefully they'll discover some new authors and some new genres. Mm, absolutely. And uh, it's a, it is a great podcast and I listen to it and I get I actually get a lot of good book recommendations to read from, from the podcast. So that that is a good thing that you do that. Okay, so we are out of time. So why don't you tell us where we can find your latest novel, Quest, and the rest of okay. them and you online. All right. Well, you can find me at davidwoodweb.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook, but you can link to that and my blog and my Twitter from my website. And I've got a couple cool things coming up I want to quickly mention. Uh, there's a new anthology coming out called The Game that both Alan and I are in. And thriller authors have taken their signature characters and redone the story Surviving the Game, which is a great classic story that's coming out in August. And then I've co-authored a book called Call Sign Queen with Jeremy Robinson. He's um, lined up some authors to each write a little novella with one of his chess team characters. So that's another one you can look out for probably in September. Excited about those, but definitely buy seven or eight copies of Quest. It's awesome. <laughs> Thanks ever so much for your Thank time, you. Dave. That was great. Well, I had a great time. I appreciate you having me.